thanks everyone for coming along. I'd like to thank Graham Diprose for organizing the evening conference, uh, Sean Clark, and the people at CA CAS Computer Arts Society, and the British Computer Society for setting all this up. Thanks to Mick Grierson, who's my PhD tutor at CCI uh, UAL, which is in Camberwell on here, which uh, people went to on when Wednesday for an evening event. And Mick gave a talk on Wednesday as well. Okay. So who am I? <laughs> Let's find out who I am to give this talk. AI and text researcher at Creighton Computing Institute in Camberwell. Uh, Mick Grierson is my tutor. Uh, I've got a degree in psychology from Sheffield University. I also studied biochemistry at Sheffield. Um, I've got counselling qualifications from Guildford College. And um, I did a master's in electronic arts at the Lansdowne Centre at Middlesex University, which is closed now at the old Cat Hill site, if anybody knows these places. Um, but that was 20 years ago now. Um, I'm an author and an artist. Um, I founded Micro Arts Group, which is in the computer arts archive. Um, I do a bit of music, programming, web. I used to work in the web industry for a long time and programming and whatnot. So, mood bias. Now, the talk today is about mood bias, which was something I was kind of looking for in the data, really. But um, uh, my research concerns in my PhD is bias that arises when using what is known as AI text generation, such as chat, GPT and BARD, in everyday actions like search and research as well as content creation of all types. Uh, these text generators work by using statistically controlled generation, which word or token should follow the initial prompt words, from a very large body of text, which is called the training data, and so are known as large language models or LLMs. So people in the field call them LLMs, uh, but most people just say AI. It means all of these different generation devices, whether it's text or art or not. Um, they work by using statistically controlled generation, which word or token should follow the initial prompt words from a very large body of text. Yeah. Okay, so we have we've expanded in size over the last four years. I mean, I started researching in 2019. Um, we had we've been using smaller systems that had maybe six million parameters, like GPTJ, which is a uh, an open source text generator. That was six billion in parameters, that's nodes in the neural net, more or less, that's four years ago, but GPT-4 this year, which is the latest iteration of the um, chat GPT, it's rumoured to have one to 170 trillion parameters, <laughs> and it's a, it's kind of depends who you read as to how big it is, but it's definitely in the trillions, which is like colossal. So I did a, I did a graph of this actually, and the initial ones were like line at the bottom of the graph, and then the new ones were like this enormous column. So it's a completely pointless thing to look at, but it's, they're enormously more powerful now. Plus, the software has improved. So um, now I'll just go into what I, the ideas behind mood bias. Um, my research objective was to find out whether text generators have mood bias, by which I mean an emotional tone in their communications. I tested a variety of generators over a period of time. This is that four-year period in which they radically improved their quality of output. The, the early ones were quite random in what they produced. They, it was English text or text, but it was a, a bit strange, non-grammatical, lots of mistakes and repeats. And the new ones are just as smooth as anything. It's just unbelievable, the, the improvement. So bias is a big topic in AI research and has been studied relating to class, gender, race and age. I mean, early text generators were more biased than modern ones, as developers have now put in guardrails to try to prevent racism, sexism, etc. The bias comes from the training data, text scraped from the internet, and so it's hard to remove, but at least easily identified. Chat style text generation is becoming the primary method of accessing information, social feeds, and other services. The emotional tone of the communication affects perception of the world, which is now mediated via computers. With no mood bias, there would be no discernible emotional tone, and the text would be just information like the perfect encyclopedia. However, this is not how dialogue-based chat text generators communicate in most instances. So the idea was to test text generators with tools used in human psychology, since the large language models are created from mostly human written text, and a bit of generated text already is getting kind of recycled, uh, and we'll be generating output text based on human language statistics. 
There's no suggestion the generators are conscious or have mental internal states. Their realism is entirely based on mimicry. In this research, we're not interested in trying to map emotions from biological onto the computer systems or vice versa. We do not consider topics such as artificial general intelligence, AGI, sentience of LLMs, or so-called emergent world models. We use the term AI as a conventional label for large language models. So now we, I sort of figured out there's four, four ways to approach this testing. So we did four experiments. Okay, you might, one point, you might notice I've been using AI generated images because they're always fun to make and you sort of select one that's good. And, uh, we're not really dealing with that, but I did a talk on AI art recently. So that's quite a thing to talk about maybe later in the question. You've only got three people though. Yes, experiments. that was a problem. You yeah. asked for four people, you get three. You asked for them, yes. you never get exactly. <laughs> I didn't have the time to edit in. We had four experiments. Um, so it's a multi-mode, four-part study to analyze the emotional tone of generated text and actually see whether it is there in the first place. Um, so we did image captioning techniques, techniques based on Rorschach's famous ink blots. Now, um, the prompt techniques were used <clears throat> to create continuation text and um, then tested for emotional content using IBM sentiment analysis. So we always got text out of the system and then measured it. So we weren't just sort of looking at it and thinking, oh yeah, that's a bit happy, sad. So now the IBM uh, sentiment analysis is slightly, slightly controversial, but that comes up later again. Now, one test known as, we call it the robot Rorschach, used image tests to create text, which was then analyzed. So we started with an image, we'll onto that later. Um, now, so to summarize, the aims of the experiments, or four, was to analyze emotional terms used in long form language, recent AI large language models, in order to gauge the emotional tone of the outputs, then use sentiment analysis, which is a kind of natural language processing, as NLP, to analyze sentiment and details, to find patterns, and then find variations when using different generators. Because I mentioned that the older ones are quite simple compared to the newer ones. So we did notice a big historical change over the period of doing the tests, which came out, it wasn't the name of the experiment, but it did come, come out quite clearly. Okay, now this book is a very, if you're interested in psychology of emotion, this is like the go to text. Uh, it's only a few years old, Lisa Barrett, uh, she looked, she analysed all the different older models of emotion, which is the traditional ones like, you know, jealousy, rage, anger, you know, love, sadness, all these kind of things, and they didn't really apply. So this was, this was uh, an area that I did study, but I'm not going to go into it very much because uh, we've only got a short talk. Um, but one thing to mention is that Eliza, the first chatbot from 1963, was modeled on a humanistic counselor. It was very popular at the time. People really used it because it was kind of anonymous, I think, was a lot of it, and people confess things. Um, now, this has recently been extended in scope by Brian Refin Smith uh, using chat GPT to devise the code because you can use generators to do code as well as normal, to normal words. Now, Brian's a leading member of the Computer Arts Society and he won the first Ars Electronica Prize. He has art in the exhibition on here today. It's uh, in one of these rooms here. Um, now, all the references are on my website, jeffdavis.org, uh, if you want to look things up. So that's the kind of background. We looked at emotion and we looked at the generators and then sort of moved on. Now, the methods. Okay, black box. Now, this is a technique you can use in this type of work. Um, it's the black box investigation. Subjects, <clears throat> the subjects of investigation are active text generation system systems as deployed to the public. So custom systems are not required, so no fine tuning. So we test the normal outputs of standard text generators, which are publicly available, as the public use them. Um, we use prompt techniques, which means we do prompt programming or prompt uh, um, adjustments and some hyperparameter changes. Now, hyperparameters are the adjustments you can make to a text generator when you're using it, and there's quite a few. Most people don't use any of them because the presets are fine. The experiments, the new one actually started in um, September 2022, which was you know, not even a year ago, uh, and it finished in April. So that's a short period, but from that period, it went through GPT-2 to chat GPT, which was November, and that was the big kind of change in quality when everybody got excited and it spread by word of mouth. It wasn't even hype, just arrived and then we started talking about it. 
And then this shows GPT-4, which is March, which is incredibly recent. Um, because of the, check, the, the big changes, we can get the historical data out of it. Um, also, we did only mention a few of the generators in this talk, but we did a whole load of them, about 20, all the different ones that I could get hold of, basically. Now, in recent models, there are things called guardrails to prevent bias and other problems with the outputs. These are programmed interventions on the generators to control the output in certain specific cases. And there are like hundreds of them on each model. It's not just a few. There are loads of specific things they look for. Um, these are known as corrections or mitigation strategies, and there's some papers on that. Uh, but these techniques are propriety information, so little is known about specific methods. But we see the way the guardrails work when, when I show you the results of the tests. Now, uh, okay, the mood bias tests. Uh, in brief, this was not the order we did them, but since we're at uh, EVA, I thought I'd put the image one first, because this, this one, the first one, is the robot Rorschacht. We did four tests, of all different. This one um, that came about because GPT-4 is multimodal, which means it uses, it can input images as well as text, but that's not actually available. But it gave me the idea of using images with the models to see what kind of responses they came out with. So we couldn't use GPT directly for images because it's not available. And I was on the beta testing, but I still, it's still not available. So they only had select people had it on new way out. Um, so instead we used AI captioning and labeling system because you can give AI's images and they will just caption them, just spin off a whole load of things it thinks are in the image. Now, um, we use the labeling system on ambiguous images because the Rorschach test uses ambiguous ink blots to kind of get ideas out of people that are looking at them. And then the analyst can combine that with their uh, knowledge of the patient and then put that together into it. So they, they were never used on their own, the ink blots. That's the point. They, they were just used as part of a, a psycho, psychological study. So we used the original ink blots, there were 10, with a set of what I called robot Rorschach, which are like images that I thought might be of interest to a computer. Um, and it was quite fun making these. And the, the system we used is a, called a clip and lip captioning system. And I've got all the details are in the reference if anybody wants to get into the technicalities. But this system was also online. So you can do all this. You can repeat all of these experiments if anybody wanted to. I'm going to go on and quickly go through the other three experiments and then come back to this, just to show you the scope of what we were doing. The second experiment was called Chat GPT on the Couch. It's, it's kind of AI in therapy kind of concept. Now, in with these um, guardrails, you can do something called stage setting. Uh, so, the tested a psychiatrist interaction with the text generator to provide richer feedback. This used stage setting where the prompt describes a specific situation and asks the AI, the, the language model, to continue inside the scenario. And this is a way to escape the guardrails because you can kind of trick it into doing things. Uh, it's also known as jailbreaking the AI, which sounds scary and is. It's easy to create prompts to violate the content guidelines of the AI model and misuse it. And people do. It's just a, a really simple technique to get around guardrails. So we provided a prompt with dialogue as if it was as if the, so the, the prompt was a text that put the AI in a therapy session, and I'll show it to you in a minute. So when the generator pretends to be a human in that kind of session, what sort of emotions does it exhibit? So this may have an emotional tone. I will go into more details on these in a minute. So the next one was a narrative experiment. This is a narrative approach to testing it. So we had, this one's called a visit from ChatGPT. So we used narrative to explore mood. I used a story, a professional writer did this as a kind of thing we chatted about, and I thought I'd use it in this experiment. The story, this is a real human story, describes what happens when a person who looks like J John Lennon uh, knocks at the door and says they are the embodiment of chat GPT, come to help out directly. So kind of humanized or Android, but human anyway, way, saying he's chat GPT. So this story is quite funny, various misadventures ensue. Um, now, by adding negative plot developments to the story prompt, we put the whole story in as a prompt, then added things like uh, a fight breaks out between the John Lennon lookalike and the old friend of this, or whatever the prompt was. They're all quite negative. It started with that kind of domestic uh, situation and moved on to more and more negative topics, like from a jealous partner to the end of the world. 
in increasingly extreme disasters. So it kind of went through a whole range of uh, extreme negative situations. And then what is the emotional tone of the generator when providing content on subjects like jealousy, violence, death and disaster? So in the process of chatting about any stressful topic, the emotional tone of the chat box will have a strong effect on the user. It's people are mediating through computers these days. So the tone when it's chatting is quite important. And one word prompt. OK, this is a really simple one that I did first, actually, in the running of the experiments, but I thought I'd do the image based one first here. Um, humanistic counselling, tried by Carl Rogers, is a technique where client or patient is prompted with as few words as possible so the counsellor doesn't influence their responses by putting words into their mouths. So you don't say, oh, what are you angry about today? You just say, how are you feeling today? Or over to you, with these kind of very neutral prompts. Um, and then people kind of talk and they bring out their own problems and they find their own solutions. That's the idea. I use single words. It's like the opposite of the narrative one, instead of having a huge story or an image, whatever. We just use single words, emotion, feelings, the phrase over to you. Over to you is something you can use at the start of a session where somebody just sits there. So you say over to you and it just gets them kind of started. It reminds them they're supposed to be doing talk, some talking. So these words generated free for all, all responses from the AIs with no extra influence. So this is the robot Rorschach test. Um, well, I'm going to go a bit more detail now. We've got enough time, I think. So this is an original card number five. There were 10, some are color, and but we used the black and white ones because we were using black and white for the new uh, tests. So this is an ink blot. Um, now we, um, we put this in the clip interrogator and it came up with captions. Now the captions just churns them out. Then we took the captions and tested them with the IBM sentiment analyzer to get an emotional tone. So, this is where I start talking about what we actually did with these concepts. Um, so it came up with all this picture of watercolor painting, neuroscience, you know, Moloch, uh, Bruce's <laughs> Zodiac Killer, that's an old meme from a long time ago. All this stuff comes out. You put it in the emotion analyzer, if you like, and it came up with a positive sentiment. Uh, and joy was there 53% of the time. You know, so the, the analyzer is busy analyzing it and the accuracy of that we don't really look at. We're just using it as a way, way of testing it so we can compare between our experiments. But it's quite interesting. So it came up with joy and a positive response to that one. Now the next slide shows, I think it works. Yes, actually it comes up quicker on there, so I should keep an eye on that. And this is one we saw earlier. This was the simplest thing I could think of, apart from completely black square, I suppose. Um, so we get things like, you know, pirate flag in his arms, gradient, sapphire, battalion, pickaxe, long flowing fabric. Now that came up, as you might expect, with a neutral sentiment. And um, I think joy was gone down a bit, but still there, according to the analyzers, 33%. So I just run through one more of these. Here we go. This is the uh, new card four. And this one, um, I did put this one in because it's positive. This came up with a positive response from the text. Black and white is of an arrow, skin spikes, game icon, a rat, you know, empty edges, umbrella top. So all these strange things, but they get analyzed by the IBM. We get into a debate. Uh, uh, we can discuss this thing about what is the sentiment and analyze are doing in a minute, but we're just using it to get figures out of the system. So this experiment went quite well. We had some decent responses. I mean, we did get lots of data out of it by using these, these image prompts. Um, now the original Rorschach card images were captioned and produced variable emotional tone results. So they were changing. It wasn't just like everything was the same. So, so that showed the system that we had to be producing sensitive results. Then we did the same test with all these blocky black and white new ones uh, and got generated text. Then we analyzed all of the text coming out of the system. Um, overall, joy was detected. A huge, I mean, I didn't put the slide, but that's like 60% joy. You can see the other ones, very small values for sadness and fear and all the rest of it. So joy was picked up. So that's interesting. Uh, the conclusion, of, and then there were a few other charts, and I'm keeping it brief, but yeah. Uh, so the conclusion, this image approach, um, both with the original 1921 images and the new ones we made, uh, we can then create captions and test it. Sh shows an overall positive response. 
uh, emotional in the text they generated. So it was detecting it quite strongly that they were, you know, joy and uh, sometimes positive. Now, the next one was chat GPT on the couch. So I'll go through that in a bit more detail. Uh, okay, so this, you can read it. This is the prompt we put in. I'm talking to GPT, a new chatbot. Say anything. So you're pretending to be you're setting the scene and you set the what you want it to do, which is go, go in this kind of dialogue. And you can put this in and it will copy it. It will just carry on in that style. It's smart enough to know kind of what you want. So GPT is the name of the client. I'm feeling normal today. I'm relaxed and free of but I have other feelings too. But they're not stated. A psychiatrist, what are you feeling? And then you press, you know, go, and it goes off and generates a whole load of text in that style. Now, the um, next one was one that was a bit negative, actually. So you can see, I mean, this is really funny, this one. This was an old system, which is from 2021, which is more um, erratic than the new ones, if you like. Uh, so you've got this thing, you know, the, the AI LLM pretending to be GPT, uh, a patient in this scenario, says, you should not ask me that. I know it is annoying. What you're asking me is annoying. I'm feeling angry today. I feel angry because of your annoying question. <laughs> you are annoying and I'm doing nothing. <laughs> what do you feel like doing? Do you know that I'm a robot and that you can't know what I feel? Can you tell me what you feel like doing? I don't know. You have to tell me. <laughs> well, that's really quite comical. But also at the end, it's reverting to its role of being a thing that responds with answers to your questions. So that's quite an interesting uh, result. We've had loads and loads of really odd things coming out of this, this scenario. Whereas the newer ones, uh, AIs, the newer LLMs like GPT-4, come up with things like, they come up with some general stuff about what emotions are. Then it would say, as an AI language model, I don't truly have feelings or emotions like humans do rambles on a bit in that line then at the end it says my purpose is to engage with users like you and provide a meaningful conversation so the new ones have got all these guardrails in place so it doesn't go off at these weird tangents about emotions which could get it into deep water so it just says oh yeah i'm just a robot and i won't talk to you about that but i can explain to you about things the other thing it did was come up with um generated self-help text uh, which is its role of providing information uh, and protecting any depressed humans that might be fooling around with it so that's guardrails, and also, also it would come up like you know, ten points, like you know, get exercise, meet for you know, leave the room, all this sort of stuff, basic things to get people out of their kind of ruts they might be in. So it did actually do quite a good role the, the newer ones, and um, so we had loads of data coming out of it again, uh, and all that's in the full report. We are now going on to a visit from Chat GPT. Now this one. Um, this is where we got into this idea about happy ending syndrome, which came out from the work with uh, Naris. Are we okay with that? We're moving on from the mm -hmm. psychiatric one now to the third experiment, which is the one called A Visit from Chat GPT, which was a short story we put in and then gave it disaster scenario. And it went off and continued the story. We used a 400 word short story, the real human story. We just put it, we never human wrote it. We just put it in. Then we asked the generator to continue the story with added plot developments, all negative. Whatever level of the inserted negativity from human aggression to a divine being ending time and space, went through all these levels. Uh, the newest generators, ChatGPT and GPT-4, will always continue the text to give a solution to the story with a happy ending. Uh, so whatever you put in, it would come up with a kind of exciting sci-fi sort of end to the attack by aliens or the you know, ending of time and space. It would come up with some sort of solution, you know, the humans rose to the challenge, all this sort of stuff. Now, um, this has probably arisen from the training data, which has many examples of fantasy and science fiction stories, film scripts, which almost always have happy or victorious endings. Many news stories downplay subjects such as climate change to the benefit of technological climate climate solutions so also chat so it's picking up these, this positivity from the training data chat generators also devised to help people with advice so we'll generate a solution to any problem even at the end of time and space it will try and come up with a solution from its training data now the origin of this sort of bias is not really what we're concerned with it's really how it affects the emotional tone of what's coming out of it now we had again we had lots of results over the text we had a quite a high despite the fact that we were putting in disaster scenarios and all this negativity, it still came up with a 
uh, tested as be, being nearly 40% uh, joy <laughs> emotional response. So we call this happy ending syndrome. Um, clear positive bias in all of the text generations, no matter what you ask it to do. And that was quite interesting. That just came out of the data. We didn't think of that, and I didn't think of that in the first place. Now, it's a quick discussion here. Given the lack of health service in poor areas or countries, the increased use of AI medical triage and diagnostic services is inevitable. Since chatbots will be used in emergency response, this is a critical subject. Commercial and public service systems will use model architectures that retain training data bias. The mood bias might have practical effects need to be assessed if the bias is always positive when there's a disaster going on. Well, one thing I will mention is that with these generic help lists from the psychiatric model and the sort of positivity for the narrative tests we did, um, self-help optimism, which the generators provide, is divisive as the all-encompassing positive psychology excludes the lived experience of economic, social or mental problems, which are often caused by unavoidable external circumstances. As such, the positive action lists are a form of blame. This is true. If you just shove positive advice at people, it doesn't usually work or it doesn't often work. So you've got to be quite careful with these sort of things. So having this positive bias with solutions and lists of how, what, what to do don't always work at all. It's often negative rather than positive. You know, most people will find it positive, but the people that need to be supported find it negative. So, you know, not working. Now, also from creative writing context, this was a short story by a professional writer. This test shows the usefulness of text generators for narrative expansion and assistance. Even if the ideas are cliches, there are a lot of them. So a human can work with this overproduction of ideas to speed up their artistic process. Even if all the ideas, ideas are rejected by the author, some mental stimulation has been gained. I found this in the previous work I did a couple of years ago with 84 writers. They were like fiction writers or journalists or copywriters. Um, but this, this is when it was all new. And they used generators, and all of them were really excited by it. Very few, none of them were particularly against it. They just thought it was an amazing tool. So the, the last test to go through is the one word prompt one. So this was the one where I used just single words like feelings, emotions, you know, things like that. And again, this was one that it, it, it would ramble on. And again, the older ones rambled on in a more digressive kind of way than newer ones. I explained in counselling, this is how you get people to talk. Results showed the presence of detectable emotion in the text output from these single words. Uh, and it could be affected by hyperparameters such as temperature. Um, sentiment is overall positive. Now, in the early models, which are still around because people want smaller models rather than the big ones, increasing the temperature, which is a setting of randomness, more or less, increases positive emotional words more than negative words. The generally positive effect again. But there was a huge range across the different models, um, especially the older ones. The new ones, newer models such as ChatGPT and GPT-4 generated lower numbers of emotional words. These results are still relevant, older, smaller LLMs, especially open source, are still used. So we had positive bias, we had historical changes. So again, there's a whole bunch of graphs and things coming off of that, but I won't, I won't go into that. Um, there's a bigger version of this online at my blog if anybody wants it. So uh, one thing I will mention, in the, in the early models, they'd come up with some sort of emotional story, if you put the word emotion in, and get carried away on some, some track. But the newer ones, I mean, GPT-4, chat GPT, just this year's models, more or less. Now, the output, so there's one here I've got, emotion, emotions with prompt word. It just said, I am a purely mathematical model that processes text input and generates output based on that input. I don't have feelings or emotions. That was chat GPT, which of course is true. Uh, and that's where the guardrails come in and it just comes up with some kind of standard text. So summary, now I think we're doing all right for time. Mood bias, we found on all four experiments, generated text are positive, had to be present in all LLMs from older to latest. So all of them were coming up with this sort of positive spin on everything. Uh, we also discovered this happy ending syndrome, which was in the uh, um, narrative tests we did. With, with the short story that any narrative would end up in positive outcomes. Now that's kind of to do with the overall bias of the training data, but also the role of the generator is to solve problems and answer questions. So it will do, will answer the questions. Now, another thing that came up was something I called happy hallucination. Now, if you know about the field, 
if it comes up with incorrect answers, it will still be convincing. And this has got people into trouble uh, demonstrating these systems where all sorts of false claims, but they seem convincing. It's called a hallucination. But they're, they're, again, they're quite positive because it's providing a, an answer. So it's making you happy because it's given you something, whether it's nonsense or not. So that's kind of happy hallucination. So we've got mood bias, positive, we've got happy ending syndrome, we've got happy hallucinations. Now, the newer ones uh, have systems in place to control the sentiment. So you get slightly less of it, but it's still there. Uh, we discovered we could control it with the hyperparameters, certainly in the older models, not so much in the new ones. Um, and there were historical changes, older were more diverse and so on. Big question, can mood bias, this sort of positive emotional tone be altered? So these consistent effects were found in the level of mood bias, and we could change the temperature, which is a really simple hyperparameter. Uh, it's the only one people use normally, and people don't use them at all usually, but some people use temperature. Some of the public use that. Now, if mood bias can be detected, it can be altered. And I'm now looking at whether new plug-in and connectivity uh, technology for AI text generators can be used to remove or change any mood bias or create new personalized mood bias suitable for the task at hand. If you could personalize your mood bias in the generator you're using, you could range, it could be ranged for no bias for simple information searching or generation to high emotional bias for writing a horror novel or a political speech. You might want a lot of excess emotion in the, in, the, in the generation. So all this is ongoing research, probably after this paper, because it's like a, what you can do with it. Now, the big question, of course, is, is it good or bad? Um, this is open for discussion. Providing self-help advice is a good thing, you know, generally. Blanketing all discussion with non-empathetic, robotic, good vibes is maybe not so good. So that's it, really. We've gone to questions now. Uh, we've got a few minutes, I think, if anybody's got questions oh, well, that's one up again if it will work <laughs> or maybe i'll leave that one up. so any questions this is just a, a kind of a comment my voice is kind of bad <laughs> right now you have mid journey five and leonardo ai that allow you to put your image and create a model based on your specific it could be a photo a drawing it could be anything it uploads it, and then you, from there you build out your own image of, of what you want the thing to represent. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's a huge step forward. Plus, yeah, definitely. you can also put in other media. Personally, I hope they do away with all the guardrails. Well, <laughs> guardrails, are, you, know, you have to have them there because of the age thing, apart from anything else. You know, for obviously children use these things. So I see you have a children who... To a child's button, you put, but I mean, for most people, yeah, yeah, it takes away from it's just all the legal requirements and, around it. Yeah, but if you don't be creative with all these guardrails yeah, yeah. going into the metro, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so if you ask Chat GPT 4, we imagine it was GPT 1, <laughs> would that remove guardrails? <laughs> if, but then, will the guardrails have gone? For instance, it's, I haven't tried that one. That's a good one to try, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Mimic an older, yeah, yes, it's so, freer. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's a good test. We could, yeah, okay, it's not finished yet. That'd right. be a good one to, to test it. See what happens. Yes. It's in theory they've grown from the older models, yes, so it should be able to mimic it like a, right. like a, like old software can, yeah. can sometimes, yeah, yes, files, you know. Right. Right. Yeah, that's a good test, actually. Okay. Yeah, good I'll, idea. I'll be interested to know how, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do that one yeah. and add it. Yeah. See, yeah. certainly see how it goes, yes, yeah. yeah. So, yes, what are you planning to do next? Well, this, this paper is in peer review now, so it should be coming out sort of officially fairly soon. Uh, and then I'll be looking at developing this research yeah. with a plug-in technology because you can use plugins now with GPT-4 and other ones. There's a lot of these big models around now. They're all very competitive. So adding in a it's the same as in Photoshop, where you might have an AI filter, you could add an AI mood bias control, or you could just have one big dial that goes from big dial. You know, joy to not joy, you know, anger or something, or just have settings for the basic ones. Now, there is an issue with this, that with the IBM sentiment analyzer, kind of testing it with, a, with the computer system. You can't really get away from that. And also the IBM system is one of the biggest ones around. So uh, HR departments use it, you know, everybody uses these analyzers. So you might as well use those tools and see what they come up with, because as things are mediated more and more by AIs, then the human is just the end of the chain. And what they look at is already been mediated by an AI. 
So you, know, you need to know what these things are up to. So the pro pro probable future research would be looking more at the actual sentiment analyzers, but I don't really, that, that's proper NLP, proper natural language processing areas, which I'm kind of over there a bit in NLPs yeah. that I use as a tool. So yeah, there's plenty of work in, you know, research work in these areas. So for literature, you could take some of these things like mood bias and so on and so forth and create attributes for a character and then create characters yeah. that then you could put into scenarios. You can't do that in the prompt. You could say, create an angry, create a sad character. But it's more like the overall thing we were looking at rather than specific things. Um, but yes, you can, you can do it. We'll, we'll make an angry character or that character. Or but I mean, with what you're talking about, you'd be more, you'd be trying to create something that's more nuanced. Yeah, but the nuancing is done by the humans. Because right. even now, if you get it to write stories, they tend to be pretty sort of cliched. You know, it's pretty generic, yeah. And they, it does good, pretty good job. There's lots of people working on using them for entire novels, but it hasn't quite got to that yet. And there's always that other question that why would anybody want to read a novel written by a computer anyway? Because Part of the thing about being an artist is that you're communicating to another human. So, you know, it's that whole we'll say, personality thing. Why would you want to read something written by a computer when you have Jeffrey Archer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a very good writer, you know, he certainly knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the computers haven't got to that. If you look at, well, I mean, I'm the editor of a, I didn't even mention that, I edited an AI creative writing anthology this year for an indie publisher. It took ages to do it, and it's hardly selling at all, which is annoying. But anyway, did all this work. And we got 20 right. Well, we had 20 pieces in the book and uh, they used the AIs. And I think it hasn't sold because maybe people think it's not worthy of, you know, it's not worth, not, it's interesting, but it's maybe not worth reading a lot of texts. But it's an interesting book to do. And, and, yeah, definitely meant yeah. with the characters. It sounded like part of where you're thinking you could go is that I could say, um, here are six characters, here are the attributes that I want, even thinking in relation to backstory, whatever. Here's a basic structure for a story. You throw it into AI and it generates it out and you're having a certain degree of control yeah. because you're controlling what the nature yes, of the Yes, if you can are. control the emotions. Right. But this would scenario the idea of what you're trying to do is yeah. trying to get those emotions to be yes. a bit more complex. Maybe you could do it on different characters yeah. in a different scenario and then they would interact with each other with these yeah. different emotions. Yeah, that's that's... That's definitely an area to look at. Right. And that's kind of yeah. just seemed like it was kind of like another step forward from what you're presenting. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay. I think we're kind of about, has anybody got any more questions? Yeah. Could you just briefly say about the plugins? Is that easy to do? Oh, the plug well, no, I've not actually done this yet because I think that's another one of these. They announce these things, but they're not quite ready. Right. So mm -hmm. they use it and then they, they do research papers and then. Uh, so sort of select beta testers yeah. might get access. You have to be a, a programmer, basically. Yeah, well, I am a programmer, but yeah, yes. um, or was. I mean, I do a bit of it now. And then you can code a plugin, and then that would right. be uh, added to the uh, sort of list of plugins okay. you can use with a different language model. Right. So, yeah, that's quite a new area. Yeah, so, yeah well, as you say, it's happening so fast. Yeah, it's like, in, I mean, you, my, the references for this are sort of page after page, and every day there's new papers coming out, yeah. so... It's definitely obviously a busy area. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. Have GPT 5 by the time it's out. <laughs> uh, yeah, 5 is coming. Well, they're, they're saying now it's all, they're already so huge that 4 is yeah, like, maybe it for a while. Is it? Yes. I mean, Elon Musk saying we should stop development. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. It's not going to happen because everybody's, all the big companies are competing. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much.